What we're going to spend most of our time talking about today is how we engage our guests in one-on-one -on -one interactions, where one educator will be interacting with one, two, or, or a small group of our general guest visitors. We do this using technology. You can see our magic planet, the glowing sphere in that top corner. This is a spherical representation of data. So rather than looking at uh, information about our planet on a two-dimensional screen, we're using a three-dimensional uh, tool. This is just one step towards our new exhibit that will be opening in next May, which is our Science on a Sphere, part of our new Ocean Science Education, Ocean Science Center, sorry, it's brand new, <laughs> Ocean Science Center where we'll have a six-foot globe, which will be able to represent um, information on, on a three-dimensional scale. So we're really excited about the use of technology, but we also use biofact interpretation, basically using tools, and we have some laid out, such as skeleton, <laughs> uh, coral skeletons, uh, costumes. This is our coral costumes. So <laughs> implementing... <laughs> oh. So implementing different kinds of tools, uh, which goes back to our background in pedagogy of uh, how, to in, how, how to engage folks. Well, we have them touch things. We have them touch live animals or real factual, this is actually what coral looks like. But a model here, and Emily is demonstrating, that corals are colonial animals. But since they are animals, they require food. Where do they have their food? Well, inside one of those polyps, Emily has little green algae, and those algae, of course, live symbiotically within the coral. So how better to illustrate corals and the concept of this symbiosis <laughs> than the algae that live symbiotically inside their tissue. So we rely on a lot of different tools and, of course, the educator, such as Emily, to bring that to life to our guests. Now, this happens on the floor of the aquarium. So this one uh, picture, and again, I apologize that the, the, the picture is not very clear. You can see Raylene, our educator, is interacting with one guest, and she's using the real model, uh, the real uh, coral uh, uh, skeleton to illustrate. Um, we have up on the top, we have our two educators using the magic planet, using technology. And then here, Jane is using a model of the Earth. Again. Um, a model, not the real Earth, to illustrate a point. And we're going to talk about how we have gotten our staff used to using these different types of tools and engaging with our guests. One-on-one -on -one interactions can happen every day, but we do take the opportunity to interact with our guests about climate change during festivals, teacher workshops, uh, and scientist workshops. So potentially targeting certain audiences that may be interested. Um, and up on the top, you can see our 350 day was one year ago today, but it challenge changes because it's not Saturday anymore. But last Saturday this year, we had uh, our 350 day. Uh, and there was mention before about uh, the parts per million of carbon that is being put out and uh, estimates for the future. And there's an estimate of 450. And on 350 day, of course, we were promoting that wouldn't it be great if we actually were closer to 350 and what the impacts of, uh, of that, impa that output would be. So using costumes, uh, everyone there is, since it was correlated with our uh, institution's celebration of Halloween, uh, everyone dressed as a 350 related costumes. So you can see right here we have a sea crate, a mola mola, and a seahorse spelling out 350, which was the parts per million goal. So how do we support climate change ed, uh, communication on the floor? We've gone about it by targeting our staff first. And the staff professional development is going to be the first step to making people feel comfortable uh, with value-based messaging, which Emily's going to go a little bit more into it, basically how do you say what you want to say and are you really saying what you think you want to say? Uh, and of course, reflective practice, which is getting our staff comfortable with some uh, concepts of effective communication with guests and going back to the roots of education to make sure that we're using the best practices possible. So to talk about value-based messaging, I'm going to pass it over to Emily. All right, so um, when we look at how to connect to our audience, when we look at um, how to most effectively impact them, it's all about where they come from and understanding your audience. So one of the things we actually train our staff to do um, through a series of professional developments 
is to understand your audience and the experiences that they bring and the kind of frames that they have in their lives. Now, the frames that people bring um, can be shaped by many number of things. It can be uh, their families, their friends. That's certainly a very potent and important frame. Certainly the news media, um, maybe they watch the Daily Show for news every day. Maybe they listen to the radio. Maybe they read Only People magazine. It, it, so all these different frames go into it. But uh, at the bottom line, it's all about understanding your audience. So these two uh, gentlemen up here both happen to like candy. Um, but in order for, and it's different kinds of candy. That, that makes it a little trickier, too. But in order to capture both of them, um, we really have to find the frame that's more universal. So a really big frame. So what we do is we try to encourage our staff to recognize what these big frames are and to really put those into practice as they uh, go out on the floor and interpret with small groups. So this is something that um, you guys can start thinking about, and you've probably thought about a fair amount already. Um, but some of the frames that we try to get our staff to think about um, are listed right here. So when we say responsibility management, it's sort of the frame that comes from uh, do this for your children and your children's children. Okay, so manage this um, commodity or this resource so that your children's children will have it as well. When we say innovation and ingenuity, um, we sort of think of technology being a great answer or the fact that humans have the ability to solve problems. We've overcome many problems before and we're going to overcome many more to come in the future. In terms of stewardship, that of course is kind of a really self-explanatory one. And for us, it happens to be mission-based. So um, for our organization, stewardship is a really nice way to connect to many people, especially when you may disagree with them on um, many other things. We can all kind of count on being good people and good stewards for our planet. Interconnectedness is one, um, also another pretty self-explanatory one. But uh, for a lot of people, understanding how they connect to an issue or a problem, like uh, climate change, you know. Oh, that you know, sea level rise is happening really far away. That's like people in Bangladesh maybe have an issue with it. But understanding that it's actually a problem that we all have is another issue. So interconnectedness is one. And certainly also interconnectedness between us, our coast, the animals that live here, that's another important one that we try to get our staff to, to sort of frame their presentations on. Um, sort of three lesser frames that we discuss in our trainings are um, the precautionary principle. Basically, we can't afford not to do something. Um, when I think of the precautionary principle, I think of like buying insurance. You know, you, you invest a little, a little, little all the time just in case something big happens, right? Uh, because you can't afford not to make that investment. Um, a lot of people will use the precautionary principle in terms of uh, conservation issues as well. Uh, the last two are um, sort of in, in terms of the research that goes behind this, and there is actually a, a group uh, or many researchers that, that collect data on this kind of framing um, and value-based messaging. Um, aesthetics is one that uh, we sort of rely on because we have a really beautiful live collection, um, but it isn't always, it's, a, it's an emotional frame, so you have to be careful when you use that kind of frame. Um, People think different things are pretty, right? Uh, maybe someone doesn't want to save the naked mole rat because it's an ugly animal, right? <laughs> but it's a valuable animal. So you don't want to always go with something that may or may not have much more universal appeal. And then, of course, the crisis frame, another emotional frame. So does it work? Yes, it works. But um, it doesn't work for everybody. So that's another frame that is, is one that's um, all these emotional frames are much more kind of shaky. So um, we're going to talk about uh, these frames a little bit more. So um, we're trying to get our staff to really understand to capture your audience using one of these big frames. Once you captured them, and that has to happen immediately, right? Like this is something you have to really take into account early. Once you capture their, uh, their attention and you've got them, you can tell them about the science after that. Because all too often, they can just walk away from you. So you need to make sure you capture their attention. Um, one example of framing, this is going to be an example of framing right here. I'm actually going to play a YouTube clip. Actually, Allie will drive it for you. Um, this is from the Coal River Mountain Watch, which is, uh, which is a uh, conservation group based out of West Virginia. Yep. So if you guys watch this, think about what frame you might be seeing. Or do we have audio? We, we formerly had audio. There we go. Let's see if it plays popped out. It may not play popped out. 
Okay. So that was one ad, because it turns out that ad makers are excellent at framing. They sort of invented it. They know how to capture their audience right away and send their message right across. Um, does anybody kind of want to guess what frame that might have been? Crisis. Crisis frame, yeah, like the, exp uh, the deer drinking out of the stream and then the exploding mountainside right after that. That's a pretty emotional frame right there. So it is, in fact, a crisis frame. Is it effective? It might mobilize people to take action. Um, Maybe not everybody, maybe not everybody countrywide, right? Um, it might work for some people. Honestly, the first time I saw this just from personal experience, I was scared. The music totally freaked me out. I couldn't listen to it. It scared me. I couldn't watch it, couldn't look directly at it, saw the stream with the deer in it. I just panicked. I said, oh my gosh, this is going to be like Bambi. It's going to be bad. So I didn't want to watch it. And so this frame honestly didn't work for me the first maybe three times I tried to watch this ad. So. Um, maybe this is not always the best frame, but it can be an effective frame um, if you connect to it, okay? So um, there is that type of frame. So that's one example of capturing your audience. Um, certainly using other examples um, might be one. I, I could crisis frame the cow. I, do you guys want to hear the crisis frame cow? Okay. So, so some people might see this as a climate issue. I certainly do, because there are lots of cows on this planet. We eat beef. It's an important part of our protein source. And those cows are farting lots and lots of methane. And you will not believe the heat-trapping ability of methane. And so this is an important contributor to global warming all over the world. So that's kind of crisis frame, right? Crisis frame. And that's over a cow farting, OK? So it's, it's really interesting how you can really prime your audience or unprime your audience um, to listen to what you have to say. Okay, so we're going to do another ad right here. This is um, based on Conservation International's ad. It's more like a PSA. It's a little bit longer um, for Team Earth. And you'll listen carefully and say, Harrison Ford, talk to me in this. When we come together, So that was um, because they had the fortune of having a PSA, a two minute long ad. You can see that they went through basically a number of frames. Anybody see any that stuck out to them in particular? Automation. 
innovation, responsibility management, some precautionary principle interconnectedness, some of everything actually. There even was a little bit of crisis if you guys saw, like the, the water issue, the water shortage issue, there was a burning hillside image. So even though Indiana Jones never said anything to us about um, uh, specifically that image, they played through many different images. Certainly they said um, what hurts one or something to the effect of what hurts one is felt here something like that. So there's a lot of different frames that they went through in that to kind of touch on everything. And then they had the music and then the imagery um, on top of that. So um, just a, a really kind of interesting exercise to think about how framing works and how value-based messaging works. Um, because there were so many frames that were visited in this particular ad, they're trying to appeal to many, many people. Um, even at the very end where they had like all these you know, corporations like Starbucks like buys into um, Conservation International. Maybe, maybe you drink Starbucks every day and you say, hey, that's a brand that I support. So um, that is the kind of thing uh, that ad makers do really, really well. But that's not to say that we can't learn something from them as scientists, as communicators, as resource managers, um, because it's very fast, it's efficient, it's effective. And it doesn't have to compromise our messaging at all. All we have to do is capture their attention, and then we can deliver the science for that. So it can actually be applied to any number of uh, conservation issues, whether it's um, conservation of one species, if we look at you know, polar ice caps, um, oil spills, uh, glaciers, you know, pollution, um, maybe renewable energy, rainforest, all sorts of things um, can be framed. Basically anything can be framed. So that's what we're trying to teach our staff to do. Um, and maybe sometime in the future we can work more with you guys about that. We'll see. Um, because it turns out that understanding your frame and the audience frame matters. And how you say something is just as important as what you say. I think a lot of times we get caught up in, I have this message I have to deliver. And I just have to tell you to say the otters. Say something, right? But the idea behind that is that you really need to think about how are you going to get that message across um, to a person and impact them when they actually hear what you have to say. The other thing that's kind of important is, what, what did I say? How did I say it? Because a lot of times when we're delivering messages, that kind of gets muddied. So Allie's going to talk about the other half of our professional development that we do at the aquarium and something that you guys might consider doing on your own as well. So I'll turn it over. All right. So now that we know we have to look very carefully at how we're saying things and how we start conversations. Um, our staff engaged in a six-month professional development curriculum that was developed by Lawrence Hall of Science, and we were really excited to be one of the first uh, institutions that started this professional development uh, curriculum. Uh, we focused on pedagogical theory and reflective practice, meaning that we were spending time talking about what are the best ways to teach, what are the best ways that people learn, and how can we as educators become better. A big portion of this professional development was uh, filming. And of course, anytime you tell your staff, we're going to film you doing your job, there you get some funny looks and you get some, um, I don't know about that. However, I think that once we started it, Everyone saw that this is, there's a benefit to doing this. There's also a benefit to watching with what we call our critical friend. Because you can watch yourself and you find yourself, oh my gosh, I say, you know, a lot. I say great a lot. I go like this when I teach all the time. Did you know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Imagine Emily and I teaching together at the same time. We'd start a whole thing. <laughs> So to look beyond the funny quirks, the crutch words, which of course are important since we want to be good presenters, uh, looking beyond those pieces into how else can I put this message across? How can I frame it a little bit differently? How can I gauge my audience to potentially use a different route? Um, and what we ended up doing was creating a develop, uh, developing a community of practice, which means that we really changed our culture. And any, anybody who has walked into a new organization and potentially tried to change the culture, whether it was just uh, starting a recycling program or instituting new ways of thinking, changing culture is a slow process, uh, but I think a really worthwhile practice. So what did we do as we reflected on practice? 
Um, we, professional development helped us break the autopilot habit. We teach programs to school children, and uh, for lots of us who have been doing it for many, many years, we go on autopilot. We walk in, and my brain turns off, and my mouth just starts saying the script, because it's worked for six years, it's going to work again today. Breaking that autopilot and having conversations of, I'm going to try this a little bit differently today. I'm going to see if there's a better way to reach these students. Maybe these kids are a little bit different. Maybe they're giving me information that's different than another school group so I can go someplace else with them. Maybe there are, uh, are different ways to present our information. I think this is really beneficial for our staff because although the autopilot is very comfortable, is it really effective? Do you keep doing the same thing just because you've always done it? Um, yeah. Uh, we develop a common vocabulary about learning and teaching. This has been really beneficial, I think, as well, because it's added to the professionalism that we feel. Many times we get from teachers, oh, you're so good with kids, you should be a teacher. I kind of am a teacher. <laughs> uh, Having that layer of professionalism to say, hey, you know what, I reflect on my practice, I know I'm good at what I do because there's theory behind it, there are actually choices I have made about my presentation. Being filmed is something that teachers should do in their informal classrooms. And so as informal educators, we should be doing the same things. There are certain commonalities between formal educators and informal <coughs> educators. And I think introducing that to our staff and breaking down some of those barriers to say, you are a professional, and as a professional, we should have certain uh, information, certain background, certain uh, pedagogy. It allows us to share our practice with our colleagues within our institution and beyond. Because we're one of the first institutions that has started this professional development curriculum, uh, we really are on the forefront and other institutions are coming up to us and saying, how has your staff reacted? What is the, what's the feedback? What's the positive impacts that you're seeing? And it's really exciting for us to be on the forefront of hey, you know what, informal educators are professionals. Let's share some of the ways that we can all together m move forward. Uh, it also has changed some of our culture within our department so that, you know what, it's okay to try something a little bit different. Maybe when we walk into a class, we don't have to worry about teaching every single thing we've always said we're going to teach about an octopus. Maybe those kids can just really know one or two things that still hooks them, still engages them, and gets them excited. Uh, and finally, I do want to add, it has not been easy, but it's been a lot of progress and we are learning a lot. Uh, our staff comes from a variety of backgrounds. Many of them have backgrounds in formal education. Uh, some have been volunteers at our aquarium and have moved up in the ranks. So that different, diverse backgrounds uh, is actually a strength. It's not a challenge. It's something that we can all come together. Um, having those conversations about, wait a minute, are you saying for five years I've taught this class and it was wrong? No, <laughs> we're not saying it's wrong. But what can we do? How can we look at how we interact with our guests and potentially change um, or, or move forward? Now, in our reflective practice, we've focused a lot on filming our interactions with school groups uh, and our classes that we have in our, um, in our classrooms at the, at the aquarium. However, we've also started moving into reflective, uh, reflective practice with our one-on-one -on -one interactions with guests on the floor. Different audience, potentially different interactions, maybe not as scripted as the classroom experiences, but still looking at what are the effective learning strategy, what are the effective teaching strategies, how can we best reach our audiences. So we want to share with you one of these reflective practices, and I'm going to share uh, one of our educators named Shelly, and she is interacting with a group in front of our live choral exhibit. Can we say one thing about the simplifying one? Of course. Oh, okay. yes. So, um, as we watch Shelly, you're actually going to hear um, her use a couple of the tools that we talked about with framing. Um, one thing that you will hear her use is something we call a simplifying model. So you'll hear her prime the audience, and then you'll hear her talk about the science. So I just want to preface the science content behind it. The science we happen to be talking about, of course, is uh, global climate change, and you'll hear her ask about that. Um, and the way we actually talk about it is we use our very high-tech and expensive Earth model right here. It's, not, it's a little bit different than that um, glowing data set, the 3D data set that you saw earlier. Um, it costs 
a little bit less. Um, and then what we do is we actually talk about the earth um, and we talk about carbon dioxide. Now one uh, of the things about kind of our method of communication is that it turns out a lot of people don't really know what a greenhouse gas is. Um, while I think everybody in this room would obviously know because uh, we are, you know, we have a vested interest in that topic. Uh, if you ask someone, you know, a layperson, what's a greenhouse gas? I don't even know what a greenhouse is. It could be a house that's green. It could be, um, I don't really know, right? And so um, what we try to use instead of saying a greenhouse gas is a heat trapping gas. And uh, what happens is as we burn car uh, fossil fuels, it builds up carbon dioxide, which is a heat trapping gas, and it forms a blanket around the earth. Now, as we burn more and more and more of those heat trapping uh, gases, it makes the blanket thicker and thicker and thicker, and it traps all that heat in, kind of like when you uh, put a blanket on uh, in the wintertime, but you can't kick it off even when you get hot. That blanket is getting thicker and thicker, and imagine that blanket wrapped around you getting thicker and thicker. It traps all that heat in, and that is what causes climate change. Okay, so using a simplifying model like that um, helps people to really understand on a normal, kind of a day-to-day -day level, because uh, everybody knows, you know, everybody knows what a blanket is, and maybe not everybody knows what a greenhouse is. So you might hear um, Shelley use that simplifying model during her little presentation. is where you can find coral reefs. And, but sometimes, corals can get kind of sick. And if they get sick, then they spit that algae out. And if they lose their algae, what else do they lose? Their food, that's right. So they can get very, very sick. Do you want to know why they spit out the coral? One of the things that happens is they can get stressed out because the temperatures in the water get too warm. So what happens is something called global climate change. Have you heard of that before? No? Well, we make a whole bunch of gases that can trap the heat like a blanket in our atmosphere. Every time we drive our cars, every time we turn on our lights, every time we use any kind of energy, we burn fossil fuels, which basically means we put a bunch of carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide is like a blanket that sits on top and the earth gets really warm and adding more blankets right on top and the warmer it gets in the oceans the harder it is for our coral reefs to survive so what we can do to help to save these corals so that you can see them when you're old enough to go scuba diving so that you can see them when you're old enough to go scuba diving is we can help by turning off our electricity, by using energy efficient appliances. Make sure you've got um, a car that has good mileage on it, or you can carpool or ride your bike. Those are all things that we can do to help to make sure that we don't warm up our earth too much because we want our coral reefs to stay around for a long time. All right, so that was Shelly um, interacting with some of our guests. Uh, she was in front of one of our live coral exhibits. So you could see the bright light right next to her was from um, a smaller exhibit that had live coral. Behind her was a larger exhibit, uh, which, was most, which was a coral reef habitat, but mainly had artificial coral in it. Uh, so what frames did you see Shelly using in, uh, in the video? Did you notice any frames? She used a little bit, she started a little bit with an aesthetic frame. She was saying, look how pretty it is. Isn't, isn't it so nice? Don't you want to see that pretty, uh, the pretty coral? So there was a little bit of aesthetic frame. Um, and towards the end, there was a little bit, anybody, did anybody see there? She sort of shifted a little bit towards the end. Yeah, a little bit of stewardship, like what you can do. And so when you go scuba diving, wouldn't it be great for you to see this as well? And so she was sort of speaking a little bit more um, to the kids, because I think the kids were sometimes a little bit more engaged in um, Absolutely, she was definitely doing some interconnection. Good. 
So one thing I love about this video that it illustrates is that when we are having these interactions on the floor, we don't rely on lecturing. We're not on a microphone presenting a pre-written speech. You'll notice she uses lots of questioning. Have you heard about this? What do you think? Um, and she let some of those answers dictate the next step in the conversation. And that's one thing that I really enjoy about these on the floor interactions because um, the listener, the learner is engaged, hopefully a little bit more invested and rather than thinking about their shopping list and what they need to do later, um, they're asked to engage and asked to, to contribute to it. Okay, our next video that we're gonna uh, show, oh. oh, I went. Uh, the next video that we're going to show is another on the floor interaction with our guests. And this is sort of, well, we like to call it guerrilla education. <laughs> you eat gorilla. Gorilla, not like, ooh, 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 but, okay. You'll see in a minute why we call it gorilla. Um, uh, our gorilla education uh, is to introduce uh, climate change to students using a special delivery. So some of the tools that we use are this fabulous overall, hmm. <laughs> it fits Emily really well. Uh, we also use, and we use a life-size blow-up model of a leatherback sea turtle. Let's show you how that looks. That's something we've actually implemented pretty recently. That was the um, third time we'd done it. It was the first time those two had done it, and we didn't script it for them. So they were actually improvising that whole thing, which is um, something that we actually encourage our staff to do as long as it's accurate. Um, they, uh, we, you know, interpreting with the public is, is really about being on your toes and being able to kind of talk about all that and make good decisions while you're 
um, while you're practicing. So um, we are developing more activities with that. It might even include dressing a kid up, making the kid the earth, and then giving them a puffy jacket so it's like a carbon dioxide blanket and seeing how they do um, and how they feel with that, kind of get the kid more involved. Um, and we're still developing all this program constantly. And so uh, you know, we, we invite you guys to uh, help us brainstorm ideas. Let's work together because I think uh, as we talk to the public, all of us are here and we all talk to the public about all of these different issues. It'll be really important for our larger community of practice to really work together and not only to uh, provide consistent messaging, but also um, to use best practices when we do it. So uh, that's what we've got for you guys today. If you have any questions, feel free to let myself or Allie know. Yeah. You know, we may not know a foot is X, you know. 
So, that could be helpful. Yeah, that's true. I work at the Disease Center as well as the National Store, and, and we try to get people engaged and participate. We have them pet the sharks, we have them, we have them pick up the animals in the wet tank, and we also have any in the wet tank, we have them participate in the activities of, of getting the samples to the uh, of the water and, and participate in that. And we get them to tell a lot of jokes and kind of get them all involved in that kind of stuff too. But, uh, so, you know, participatory things seems to seem be engaged a little bit more. You know, having done 30 years of scouting, we know they're kind of different age groups, you know, how long your, your span is and so this you get a lot of school kids going through, you know, you get a lot of all that is you kind of read the audience and kind of see how much interest they have because some are kind of blase all the way to people who are intentionally in, uh, interested and educated, you know, so you get to kind of read the audience as you go along. I would, add, I would add one thing to that. The, the interaction that we sh saw Shelly doing in front of the live coral, I think that's a really good point. Uh, the video that you saw was a fairly long interaction. I would say that that's not necessarily the norm. Every interaction is going to be slightly different based on maybe the, the audience that you have as an adult, as a child, or just their background information. For Sometimes when you hold the coral, um, just getting to, that's an animal is kind of extreme enough and oh my gosh I had no idea um, and if that's the new information that we're able to present then that's a, a great interaction. If we're able to get further to uh, the relationship that they have with coral, the impact on um, climate change, if we can go further you know based on the, the audience I think that's a, that's a really good point that each interaction is potentially going to lead to a different end point.